Okay, well, I just wanted to start. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions about your own background and history and stuff, starting uh, with your, um, whether it's your folks or your great, your grandfathers or grandmothers. Who came here? When did they come here and why? Vermont? Mm -hmm. Well, my, my father was raised by um, Albert Lodel, who used to have a meat market in Bayfield here. My father's father was killed when he was uh, 29 years old. So there were three orphan boys, and they moved to Bayfield, and they were raised by their aunt, uh, Albert Lodels. Mm -hmm. So for many years, I went by the name of Vermont Lodel, because did. people thought that mm -hmm. that was our name. Until we moved away in Duluth in 1927, then we took our name of Johnson back. And um, they had a meat market downtown, the Lodel meat market. And the three boys were raised by this family. And uh, we left here in 1927 and moved back in 1936. My folks started Johnson's Food Shop, a grocery store. And then uh, when we come back in 1936, that's when I met Harriet. And, so, and why did you move to uh, Duluth in 27? That was year of the Depression. And uh, my father was a meat cutter. We went up and he worked in Duluth and worked in a meat market. And then after the Depression, 1936, who always wanted to come back to Bayfield and moved back to Bayfield and started the grocery store. And then I come back, and then that year, Harriet and I, we both went to the University of Wisconsin in 1937. And that's when I met Harriet. And what grocery store was this? Johnson's Food Shop. And that's the one that was right there? next to the Standard Oil Station that was washed out during the flood. We had the grocery store of 1936, and the flood come along with it. 41, Harriet? Uh, 41. 42, 42, 42 July right. 42. And uh, washed the store away, and they lost everything. And then after that, uh, I was in service, and uh, my father went down to Chippeway Falls and worked in a, uh, as a plant guard down in the munition factory. And then right after the war, we come back and started another store. My brother and I got them started in the grocery store, and that's where the present Andy's store is now. And then in a few years, they sold out and moved down to uh, on the corner there where Old Holmes had the drugstore. And that's where the... Uh, Xanadu, Xanadu is, is now. now. We bought that building. Oh. And, and they uh, continued there. But now, where was Little's Meat Market? Right where the uh, Easter Seal was. Mm -hmm. And they had a reputation, the best sausage in northern Wisconsin. And then, uh, 40... Then right when the war started, or I went to university after they started the grocery store and got that started and went to university. Then I went in service and come back and we started the second grocery store and then I went into my field of education. And Jack stayed and ran the store with his folks. Mm -hmm. But so. now, Lowell's raised you boys because your mother died. My, my, my grandmother and grandfather. My grandfather was killed on the tram down here loading lumber uh, he was 29 years old, and the following year, his wife, which would be my grandmother, they said she just died of a broken heart. And they had three boys, just young, they were young people, and they were orphans. And then the Lodel raised the three boys. And what were, the, who were, the, what were their names, the three boys? It was Albert, who worked in the meat market, and Harold. Uh, Jing. Jing, they called him Jingling, that was his nickname. Call him what? Jingling. How did he get that name? I don't know, it was just a name that he cropped up with, mm -hmm. and the three boys stayed in the store business all their lives then. And your, so, and your, uh, <coughs> your dad's name was what? Norman. Norman. And like I say, we all went by the name of Lodel. Norman Lodel, they called Albert was Butch Lodel, and Harold was Jingling Lodel. But then doesn't he finally was called Jingling Johnson? Jingling Johnson, yeah. Mm -hmm. But did, See, after, did after, after, ever take after, uh, Yeah, Johnson? after we, after they left the Lodel's Meat Market, Butch also moved to Duluth. After we, they left them, then they, they took their regular names of Johnson. So I can go up to school here and pick up my records of Vermont Lodel, and uh, all my um, Beverly Lodel, that was Butch's daughter, they all went by the name of Lodel, along the state in Bayfield. It's not funny. So then, after we come back, then to just assume the name was Johnson, that was it. Right. But a lot of people still refer to refer Okay, to so me. when did your grandparents come to town? Uh, my folks, uh, mm. my grandparents never did. They lived in Ashland when this oh. all happened. And then that was about 19... Uh, mm, Boy, about, six about, or seven? About 19, six or seven, when they were killed or died. And then they come and moved to Lodels. And the Lodels mm -hmm. lived up where uh, Mrs. Hyde lived. Oh. That was their home. 
And this Albert Lowell was quite a, he was German, quite a prominent butcher. And uh, So your, your dad was raised in Bayfield, though? Raised in Bayfield, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you, how old and were I, you when you left? I left here in 1927. I was, uh, what, six, seven years old at that time. Then I went to school and I graduated from Duluth. Then after in 36, then we come right back here. Couldn't so, stay away. Couldn't stay away in the summertime. <laughs> and our whole career, in even the field of education, both Harry and I, were always remained close enough so we get back to oh. Bayfield on weekends. We had a cabin out at Little Sand Bay, and uh, then we retired. We come back to Bayfield mm-hmm. permanently. Is Lodl's Meat Market the same place that Gold Finds were once? No, no. Not that mm-hmm. I know. Do you know anything about that? I remember the old Goldfine uh, family originally here, and then from here they moved to Duluth. I remember mm-hmm. talking about the name Goldfine, and that was Irv and Monty Goldfine, their offsprings of the Goldfines that had their store in Duluth. But I remember the name. He was primary uh, adult in Hides, I think, mm-hmm. the Goldfine did. Your yes, dad sir. used to talk about the gold selling fine. hides, hides the gold to fines. the gold finds. Because mm-hmm. somewhere when Chris was tearing his building apart, you know, where was mm-hmm. your store, mm-hmm. he came across the, the plat book or something or that listed gold finds in that building well, next see, door, not his. Well, they, now they might have been in there. See, Lowell and Ernest had a meat market up where uh, the laundry mar- mark oh, okay. was. And then they moved down to this other place. And then in the summertime, after Harriet and I were married, we got back. We'd come to Bayfield every summer. I was teaching. Then I started the trolling business back in 1948, right after I got out of service, 47. So I trolled for 40-some years a trolling boat. You did? You were mm-hmm. one of the first ones. I was one of the first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was your first boats? The first, the first boat I, we bought was named the Jaha. For Harriet and I were married, Johnson and Haugen. Uh-huh. And I still have the stern of that boat up, up at home there. We found it again. We call that the Jaha. Then after we got out of service, when I was in service, Harriet taught school in Bayfield, and she was saving money for a fur coat account. Well, after I got out, I said, you don't need a fur coat, I'll keep you warm. <laughs> and our first boat was named the Shark. But that's where the fur coat account The went. fur coat bought, bought our first boat. We've had boats ever since. And, uh, but no fur coat. <laughs> it was during that time that... Uh, you can see where the priorities that's were. Right. One of my prime customers at that time was Governor Youngdahl. And uh, it was on my boat where he decided to resign from the governorship of Minnesota and take that, uh, that judge ship in Washington, D.C. Is that right? And they would come up, and he'd go out two or three days at a time. <clears throat> We'd always had to meet, meet him on Madeline Island because he didn't want people to know that he was in town. And uh, he was quite a wonderful man, Judge Young Dahl was. Well, Harriet, what about your folks? Our well, grand- um, my parents came here in 1920. My dad had immigrated to the United States from Norway <coughs> and uh, bought 10 acres of land in Bayfield. He had been uh, streetcarring in Minneapolis. And a land company, you know, got a hold of him and said, there's beautiful land in northern Wisconsin, cheap, and they're begging for people to come. So they packed up their three children and their worldly possessions and came to Bayfield. Had never been to Bayfield until they arrived here to live. And uh, spent their first few years on a farm west of town. Which is, which one? Where Hilding Leafblad lives there now. And at the time my folks lived there, this would, would have been from 1920 to 1928, uh, Turnquist here in Bayfield owned the land and it was a relatively new farm with a beautiful big barn and uh, my folks were very hard workers and so I have wonderful memories of growing up on the farm with uh, oh dances in the fall up in the haymow and all the farmers would come and their families and they had basket socials and you know they made their own music there were if they didn't know how to play an instrument, they learned in a hurry. And uh, there were basket socials nearly every Saturday night. All winter long, they had doings. And ultimately, they, they did build a town hall out there. And then, of course, the social gatherings moved to the town hall. But before that, before they got the town hall, the, the barn, the haymow in the big barn, was the mm-hmm. scene of many of those parties. What, what is your family name? 
Haugen. And then in 1928, my dad had... Uh, made lots of friends in Bayfield. I think they saw him as a great big tall husky Norwegian who wasn't afraid of work and had a tremendous personality. And uh, the Standard Oil Agency here in Bayfield was losing the man who had been the agent. He was moving to Indiana and uh, they asked my dad if he'd like to take the gasoline truck. And he said, Val, I, I think it sounds pretty good. <laughs> so we moved in off the farm. And <coughs> for the next um, 50 years, he drove a gasoline truck. And when he was 75 years old, he was still moving 50-gallon oil drums on and off that truck like a 30-year-old man. So uh, I guess hard work was oh, just part of his, you know, that was the thing mm -hmm. in his life that kept him going. And he lived to be 90. What was his name? Helder Haugen. And your mother? And Myrtle Haugen. And mm -hmm. she uh, was very active, too. When Once they moved into town, then mother became very active in church and lodge. And she was uh, president of the garden club here for many years. Oh, and... Uh, you know, we have so many beautiful lupins in June that all come into uh, bloom. And back in the 1950s, when Mother was president of the Garden Club, she said, I think we should do something to beautify Bayfield. She was really, you know, like uh, 20 years before her time. Or it, it, Nowadays, everybody thinks about beautification. But back in the early 1950s, I. Th there wasn't that much emphasis. But anyway, she went to Mr. Brubaker, who had the flower farm at Washburn, and said, what can we plant that will easily grow and that will beautify Bayfield? And he said, I'll give you all of the seeds if the garden club in Bayfield will take on a project of scattering them. So it became a family joke <laughs> that uh, between mother and dad, because he said from, you know, Saturday afternoon until Monday morning, he and mother were busy driving the byways of Bayfield County. But as a result of that, just look at all the lupin seeds that are scattered all over Bayfield County. And it's the Bayfield Garden Club that did it. I love it. Where'd your mother come from? Was she native to here or where? No, she had, uh, she had lived in Minnesota and uh, had worked in hotels after she finished school, high school. She began working in a hotel in Detroit Lakes. And my dad was just a very young fellow. Uh, he had, as I said, he emigrated from North Dakota. And he, was, he, had, he had an aunt and uncle who lived at Fargo. <coughs> And when he was 16, they really, this aunt and uncle, wanted him to become a Lutheran minister. Well, my dad wasn't interested in being a Lutheran minister, so he just got out on his own, and he was a timekeeper for a construction, road construction crew. And as they were building roads through uh, Dakota and Minnesota and Wisconsin, of course, they traveled a lot. And while they were in the Detroit Lakes area, this road crew stayed at the hotel where my mother was working. And so they met, and that's how they <laughs> met, and got married. And then Dad quit the road crew, and they went to Minneapolis, and he began street caring. And ended up in Bayfield. And ended up in Bayfield. And they loved Bayfield. I think it's interesting how they come over, two of the three children. The parents didn't come. Oh, yes. That is interesting. You know, my dad came to, um, came over about 1890 or 1892 from Norway. He and a twin brother and sister who were a year older than dad. Dad was 11 and the twins were 12. Uh, he often, as he grew older, he told more about this trip over here. And 
it was always a, a quite sad for us to hear him tell how his mother and father tried to find one item in the house for each child that was of some value. Mm -hmm. And they gave my dad a little china shoe. It's about six inches long. And uh, it's really very beautiful. It has gold trim on it. And all through our growing up years, that true, uh, shoe sat on the living room table and that was verboten. You just didn't touch it because it was like the, the family uh, jewels. Yeah. Did the parents and didn't come with I have the shoe now. I ended up with the shoe. But the, the parents shoe. didn't come with it. No, the three no. Children. The three they children they put them on, came, a, on the ship and sent them over by themselves. And they never got, not any one of the three ever got back to Norway. Oh. Which never was saw their too folks bad. again? Never got back to Norway yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, that's sad too. Yeah. That. Uh, Neither mother nor dad nor his brother and sister who grew to old age here never got back. Right. Right. Yeah. But those were hard years. Uh, when, when that group of immigrants came to America, those were very mm -hmm. hard years in all of the European countries and Scandinavian countries. And if they had relatives who were living in the United States and could help in any way with children to they they sent their children over here because it meant a better life for them did the, did the great grandparents ever are the Never. ever have more children oh yeah they yeah, had okay, uh, so. in fact they had seven or eight children when the three youngest oh, came over that? here and my dad corresponded with them it was in Norwegian, of course, but I have letters in Nor written in Norwegian at home that we saved that uh, his family had written to him, mm -hmm. and then he, in turn, would write back to them. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's when my family took off. Yes. See, was there was, slightly before that. Actually, there were so some... many immigrants who came mm -hmm. about that time. The in, We often asked Dad. He didn't remember too much about the ship, although it was small. And, of course, they were very poor. So they were down in the hold of the ship. Their passage was the, the poorest, the lowest you could buy. And uh, he said it took about three weeks for them to come, and his mother had sent dried fish and hard bread and cheese, and that was packed in a little wicker, wicker basket. And they had to take, you know, enough that the three of them could live on it for three weeks because that was the estimated time of travel. And he said he, that many, many people in the hold of the ship were terribly ill. And a baby died on the trip, and um, he didn't remember whether it was very. He, they were kids, you know, 11 and 12 years old, so they didn't remember the details of that. But he did m mention how hard the trip was. And now, how old were you when you moved off the farm to come to town? I was eight. And, and so then you started going to the... To the and Bayfield I had gone to the Bayfield School, of course, by school bus. Oh, you had? Oh, yes, from the farm, because they had uh, bus routes then. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time that I rode the school bus from the farm, uh, they were ho horse-driven. And in the wintertime, they had a sleigh with a cover over it, a canvas mm -hmm. cover. As I think about it, I wish I had a picture, because... You know, it was like the old prairie schooners to some degree. Mm -hmm. And they had a little um, oil, kerosene round stove that mm -hmm. sat in the back to keep kids warm. And we'd always save a sandwich from our lunch and then toast it on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it stunk. <laughs> uh -huh. But then when I moved in town, of course, then you walk to school. Yeah, so where'd you live when you moved? Oh. All the people in the cities left well, us. Yeah. Wonderful today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so okay. where'd you move to when okay. you came to when, when we moved in off the farm, our very first home, and once again, we rented the house. It was owned by people by the name of Lehigh. And it is now the bread and breakfast place where uh, Susan Larson lives. 
sure. that big yeah. square the house. Manor that ended up ha in Hanlon's hands. Somehow. That's right. Okay. That's right. Uh, so we lived there for, from uh, about 1928 to 37, and then and while we were there, uh, I always felt really scared in that house. I guess because you know it had that widow's walk up on the roof. And all the kids in our neighborhood said there were ghosts up there. <laughs> so I would, boy, I'd go to bed and cover my head and never say peep. Yeah, I didn't want anybody, I didn't want the ghost to find me. And then in 1937, my folks bought the Pickett House, oh, okay. which is where Sherry and Phil Peterson yeah. live now. And um, my folks owned that then from 1937 until 78. And by that time, both mother and dad had died, and then we sold the house. And up in the attic of that picket house are all the letters that I wrote to Harriet while we were going together. <laughs> Seven years of letters, and I don't think, I think Petersons have it, they won't give them to me. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're, they're going to blackmail us someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet you he does, too. <laughs> well, uh, to go back to letters, when my folks bought that house, uh, I was at school at the university, so, uh, Months went by, they had moved in, and I, I of course knew they had moved in, but hadn't seen the interior of the house. And so it was long after they were settled there that mother mentioned one, one day that Dr. Pickett's daughter had left boxes of love letters up in the attic, Alta Pickett. And boy, did we have fun. I could hardly wait till we put a ladder up to that hole to get up <laughs> into the attic, you know. And we found Alta Pickett's love letters. Uh, they were really, there, there wasn't that much to them. But she had left all of her letters up in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> well, now joined by Vermont. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, yeah, speaking of that, ground. now, how, when did you guys meet and how? We met in 1937. I was going to school, the University of uh, Superior, and I had a football accident and come back to Bayfield to recuperate. And Harriet was a senior in school. And uh, we went to a church party over at uh, uh, Presbyterian Church on New Year's Eve, and we got paired up to a Bible verse. What? They were. You were the the boys had one character and you had to find your mate and that was the. But it wasn't a Bible first verse. It was a, Anthony and Cleopatra oh, and oh. you know and he didn't know who Anthony was. Well, I do, but I was kind of hoping to be something. And I different. bailed him out. You know, I thought, well. So we said. I didn't know him, so I shunned him. When I heard he was Anthony, and I knew I had been given the name Cleopatra. I quit well, looking. Anyway, to make a long story. Because I didn't know him, and I thought. To make a long story short, we were so paired up that night, and I, there were very few nights that we didn't have a date after that. And we <laughs> went, uh, went together, steady, and I uh, went all the way through the University of Wisconsin. To, together. And then. Uh, after I went to service in 42, we got married on Christmas Day, 1942. And uh, He was going overseas. So, so we went together about six we years before we here. got married. Hmm. And uh, then I went overseas. Then Harriet stayed and taught school in Bayfield. Yeah, how long did you teach? Well, just, just through the, the war. war. And as soon as he got back uh, after the war, then he began teaching. We just reversed roles. I went back to started keeping house again and ultimately we had children and moved through, uh, really throughout the state. Went down the east side of Wisconsin and came back up the west side and <laughs> that took up 30 years and by that time we were ready to retire and here we are back in Bayfield again. <laughs> so I, we both taught in Bayfield. We, we did. I went to kindergarten in Bayfield and uh, taught in Bayfield and uh, in fa well, see, when he came back from the war, I was teaching up here, and so I said, okay, why don't you take my job? And it was fine with uh, Carl Larson, who was superintendent at that time. He said, fine. They really wanted a man because they had been so short of men mm -hmm. on the faculty during the war, and the minute he got started teaching, you know, he had Saturday morning Phi Ed, uh, basketball <laughs> coaching, mm -hmm. uh, 
we really all these things that they family. hadn't been able to have. Time to start a family, so we could. Sure. Prepare. We had been married two or three years by then, so we said, good. So he, he began teaching. Mm -hmm. So we you'd go and, and then from then on you were you were teaching in other towns, other towns. Yes. but coming back in the summer. We always spent our summers in Bayfield and every holiday we'd come back to Bayfield. And we always knew we were going to retire back in Bayfield mm -hmm. and we didn't want to get too far away. And we had a cabin out of Sand Bay and uh, we spent our summers there. And when did you finally come back? When 1975. We bought the Apostle, we were living in Ashland, Vermont was at the Ashland School, and I was teaching at Ondasagan, which is a school district between Washburn and Ashland. And uh, in 1975, the Apostle View Motel was for sale. Mm -hmm. And we heard about it and said, gee, that's something we haven't done yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I called I up by the Vernigs, the, <laughs> the owners at that time, and, and asked if they were selling the motel. And she said, yes, we are. And I said, well, I think you've got a couple of interested customers. Can we come and talk to you about it? And she said, we'd love to have you. So on Sunday afternoon, it was like paying a social call. <laughs> Got we there at 2 o'clock and 3 yeah. o'clock we bought it. And <laughs> we sat around the fireplace, you know, and visited. And Vermont said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, gee, it looks good to me. Shall we buy it? And he said, well, looks good to me. <laughs> and so we bought the motel. And from that, that was, then we were back home. And you're still running it now? No, we, we, sold we, sold, we had it for eight years and sold it. We decided. So now you're that. really retired. That's right. <laughs> So every time we come to Bayview, we, we seem to be bought a house. We come over here one evening for coffee, <laughs> and we bought the house uh, uh, across from the um, written, house, written yeah. house, that little house there. Oh, we sure. bought that in about an hour. <laughs> and one Sunday or Saturday afternoon, we come over to Bayfield, and I went by a house that's for sale. I called Lee and McCarty. He said, yeah, it's for sale. I said, how much? He told us the price. I said, we'll take it. He said, I won't sell it to you until you look at it. So we looked at it and bought it. So we're very impulsive buyers. <laughs> And then when we bought the motel, it was like playing Monopoly, you know. We traded all of our houses in the <laughs> <laughs> to buy the motel. <laughs> oh. so. Well, it is a great motel, too. Well, oh, we enjoyed it. In fact, I stayed there under your tenure once. Oh, did you? Way back in the mm -hmm. Dark Ages. We, uh, actually, of all of our years of married life, I think that was perhaps the most fun. Not the most fun. Our, the most fun was we lived at Solon Springs. That was Vermont's first job in administration. And our kids were growing up, and you could, you know, it was a community like Bayfield. It didn't cost you anything to have a good time. You could swim all summer and ski all winter and toboggan. And it didn't cost you a dime. So our, our children say, too, oh, weren't those good days. Yep. Yeah. So uh, really, we, you know, it's been a fun life. Now, how many kids do you have? We have two daughters. One live, both are married and have families. One lives in Minneapolis and the other at Mosney, Wisconsin. What are their names? Uh, Judy Bird in Minneapolis and uh, Kathy Habeck Mosney. at Mosney. And both girls happen to be teachers. I think, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they got the idea from us or decided that uh, teaching was kind of fun because we really enjoyed no matter where we moved we had fun do they come back here oh they yeah, love bayfield, bayfield. Yeah. well the, which one judy ran the store uh, kathy. kathy kathy, kathy ran, had the, the cheese board before yes and, you know, oh really she cries every time she goes by yeah she's uh, she can hardly oh. wait to come back to bayfield and start another business but they have two little boys two and three years old so until those <laughs> Boys get older, you know, she's going to have to <laughs> play it straight. Yeah, that's right. That's what we've said. Our retirement was kind of planned. And like I say, we had planned to come to Bayfield, and we mm -hmm. knew we had former classmates, friends that were coming back to Bayfield to retire. So it was pretty well planned. It wasn't mm -hmm. accidental. Yes. In fact, through the years, you know, uh, Mickey Nurse and I grew up, we, we went all through grade school and high school together and many, many camping trips together. 
So through the years, whenever we'd get together with Mickey and Lyman and their two girls, we'd say, well, you got to save your money because we have to buy a house in Bayfield someday. We're going to move back. And sure enough, we, you know, the four of us moved mm -hmm. back here at the same time. Oh, you did? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Your last uh, school post was Ashland? Ashland, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. In what position? I was the business manager, assistant superintendent. And I was superintendent of Spooner for 10 years, Solon Springs, Galesville, that's down by Winona. Uh, I started out coaching. And he made the circuit as a coach, larger and larger schools. And I got an administration, started at the bottom again, and worked the way up. It was good. We enjoyed it. On my list here, I was taking notes before now, so you know what to talk about. We've got to go all the way back to the pageant. you got to tell us all those stories. Okay. I, Vermont remembers so much about, about the, pageant. the pageant. Let him get started. Ah, see. Now, well, where are the pageant grounds? Well, the pageant grounds... Uh, and was, when was the pageant? I remember the pageant about 19... Seems it was two years, 26 and 27. 26, 27. And I remember the, the initial beginning of the pageant. This big group was coming in. As, as a child, I remember these people coming from Chicago. And everyone just a little bit leery of Chicago. What's, what's coming? And uh, so the, the pageant was out where they call it, um, what's the name, the, the Chicago Schooner Creek? Bay. Schooner Bay. is. And they built a big wooden bridge across, and from the land side across to the peninsula. And I remember this old rickety wooden bridge it seemed at that mm -hmm. time. And I think the thing that impressed me, those were the days of the Model T Fords, and these long lines of Model T Fords mm -hmm. from Bayfield. And I'm sure there are other makes, but the Model T stood out in my mind. And they would take this long road going through Redcliffe, winding down to or now Schooner Bay, and it was muddy and clay. And narrow. Very narrow and clay. And they took so long to buy sell tickets to get across the bridge that these Model Ts would be laying this line. Oh, I'm sure they were at least a mile, a mile and a half long. Mm -hmm. And those were the days you had to crank your car. And no one wanted to shut their motor off because they'd crank it and that Model T might not start. So they'd <laughs> leave them run. And I vividly remember looking down and all the steam coming up yeah. out of these radiators are boiling the radiators dry. So the little kids would come along with pails and they'd sell a pail of water for a nickel to put in the radiators to keep these cars going. What little kids? Well, uh -huh. farm kids out there. And yeah. maybe you, oh, some, you. some of us little kids that got out there. Because you see all the you kids the went for a full day with the parents. It was a full day's expedition to go to the pageant grounds. See, all you needed was a pail, and you could make 50 cents to a dollar. In fact, you could fill it up and pour it in the radiator, you know, and of course... The water came from the lake. So we, ho we, would right hope, we would hope that they wouldn't sell tickets too fast. <laughs> and, uh, that was our spending money, mm -hmm. filling the radiators. And up. what was this pageant? It was a replica of the early days of the Bayfield area. And I recall they, they had the schooners going out, the old Madeline Isle would leave Bayfield loaded with passengers, they'd go out. And every day it was a different program. And they, they would come around the point in their canoes, their mock Indian battles, and going through the different eras of, of uh, the point in Bayfield, how that started. And up on the hill they had authentic Indian village. And they, these, back in those days they were authentic. They lived in their teepees and their wigwams. and. Uh, it uh, real, real lifelike of the uh, portraying the Indian life, and people sat on the blankets on the side of this hill. It was a natural arena. Arena, mm -hmm. and of course, the site of the Indian pageant. With this big beach, all of the Indians come into their canoes, and they were always careful to get the old schooner Madeline off to the side, so it wouldn't be in the forelight as these Indians come through. It was very authentic, and it was it went on for two years. And would it be given every weekend or? It was given daily. Every day? Mm -hmm. Every day. Daily. And I For recall. Midweek, you know, right through the week. Every day was a different program. And I recall uh, they were recruiting the young high school girls through this one period they were supposed to have their dances. And all the parents said, that's terrible. The men from Chicago are just going to ruin our daughters. <laughs> and a couple of years ago, we went down to Bayfield, some of the historical pictures. And we have the pictures of the girls in their semi-short skirts that thing, and I, I can go through and pick out the England girls, the Welsh girls, mm -hmm. and the Freeman girls who were mm -hmm. in this 
chorus line. line. <laughs> but the parents, uh, they didn't like this. It's, uh, they're going to they're going to abuse these girls. Well, See, nice. that was like <laughs> a, uh, an intermission, so 20s, no, entertainment. Uh, while they were getting costumes and whatnot ready for another part of the pageant. The part of the Indian pageant that I remember were the horses. And the ads, uh, we have ads at home from newspapers at the time that said that horses, they got horses in from North Dakota. And I do know that was to be a fact. And uh, they had about 400 horses and riders. So in these Indian battles, it really was, you know, very exciting and very authentic because they had so many of them. Well, who put this thing on? I mean, who was behind it? A group of promoters from Chicago. <laughs> they come up and they built this big hotel across, uh, what's the, where Grunkies now, they built a tremendous big hotel. Yeah, but it had to At the side light, you had to go through Red Cliff. And there were full-blooded Indians in Red Cliff at that time. And this one store called Buffalo's Store, it sat up on the side of the hill. And it was all wood board clad building. It was always dark as you go in there. There'd be barrels of crackers. Well, there weren't any windows other than the two front windows. You know, it was... Pickles and uh, kerosene. And I would call walking in here, and this old Indian fellow, he'd be sitting there with a hat on. He wouldn't say much. He'd just sit there and look, just kind of grunt. And of course, he, uh, the clerks were around, and they would sell you candy and stuff. They didn't have much merchandise, and it was everything was in boxes. It was scary and to go in there; it was so dark and smoky. And uh, but he was a full-blooded Indian, mm -hmm. uh, Chief Buffalo, and that was there for years. That store, and you can imagine I'm sure the people by coming the in. The late thirties, though, Buffalo's store was gone. But the people because coming in from Chicago. By that time, there were enough cars around this. that people came into Bayfield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was quite for the Chicago tours coming in here. But to go back uh, to the to the promoters of the uh, Indian pageant, they were from Chicago, and they put out came up here and put out the Indian pageant cookbook. Do you have one, Mary? Mm -mm. Golly, I'll see if I can track one down oh, for you. God, you know, they're so a good, yeah. real uh, <laughs> prize. Really. I have one. Mine is is just in terrible condition because mother, it was like the family Bible. Well, sure. All of your good recipes were in the Indian pageant cookbook. And they came from the best cooks in Bayfield, just like any Bayfield cookbook. Sure. They contacted the best cooks. And uh, for instance, there's a recipe in it for cooking whitefish. And you bake it until the eyes pop out. <laughs> uh, just very interesting recipes, not uh, not like you would think of but, today. But to continue on with this pageant, uh, these people come up and the promoters are rather uh, nebulous kind of <laughs> promoters, and uh, <laughs> and they uh, they absconded some of the money. With the money. A lot yeah. of people were left high and dry on this. Exactly. And years yeah. afterwards, some of the more or less desirable characters from Chicago had a retreat out in that particular, at the patching ground. They still had that retreat. And there are stories of rum running and bringing liquor in from Canada. You probably have heard oh, that yeah. with vessels. And of course, a lot of that, st lot of that stuff was hanging over the side in a, in a weighted box. And if anything, an, a suspicious boat come along, all they did was cut the line, let it sink the bottom. So that bay has some pretty good uh, liquor out there. If those bottles ever break and you start drinking that water, you might have a pretty good, uh, pretty good drink. And there's ten cases of scotch out there that, that they know of. They know the boat that it come off from. And uh, there's quite a history of those three of the three wrecks out there. Have you been out there and seen the three wrecks? Oh. The, uh, there's quite a history of those uh, three vessels and how they got there. And that's which uh, ones are they now? Oh, I I should know the names of them out there too. I have the names of them all at home and how where they come from and how they were wrecked and they, they scrapped them out there side by side. There's a tug out there and two uh, ore carriers oh, that are out there. In Schooner Bay? Oh sure, you can go out there and see them right now. Oh you can <coughs> go out in a boat and uh, <coughs> you know go right over one of them, one of the carriers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the ribs and everything are there. There's three of them laying right in a row. Mm -hmm. and one of the largest mm -hmm. tugs of the lake mm -hmm. is, is laying out there. Mm -hmm. So next time you take the boat out there, just pull oh, in Schooner yeah. Bay and, and they're laying against the bank. They're on the, the north side of Schooner Bay. Yeah. And when we go up there, I, you can Oops. almost still see.
again. Let's do it again. Not only the Bayfield businessmen lost money on the pageant, but they had come up a year before the pageant was given. They worked a whole year collecting money and raising money and getting the cookbook ready so that the cookbook, Indian pageant cookbook, could be sold. And uh, many, many Ashland people had invested in this uh, promotion because, it, you know, it, it was a good thing, and I think they would have really made money. But uh, the, once the money seemed to be rolling in, they, the promoters from Chicago decided it was a good time to disappear. And so they didn't, the money didn't roll away the first it, year. It, it rolled away the it, second, the second year. When they're getting ready to close down. That's yeah. right. See, a lot of people go up by special trains. They send special trains in here. We trained a day coming in here for the pageant. It was promoted very highly in the mm -hmm. southern part of the around Chicago area. Gee. That's and, just uh, amazing. See, unfortunately, the bills didn't come in until after all the money was gone. Yeah. You know. Well, now, did it run in July and August, or just in August, or? I uh, would say July and August, about or, six, or, or recall, possibly in about August. About six weeks. Mm -hmm. Good yeah. Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah, rain or shine, it was going out there. It was a tremendous project in those and days. And many, many people yeah. attended every day. Uh, I, I can just, I know that the day we went, we left early in the morning, and we had a car, a Chevrolet car with side curtains on it. Mother packed baskets of food, and everybody brought picnic baskets of food, and you spent all day at the they pageant had, grounds. They had an evening performance, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was a tremendous... And then you came home after dark? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I've heard... Now, this is the first good description of the whole thing mm -hmm. we've ever had. My mother has got out in a trunk out on the island arrowheads from the pageant. Mm -hmm. They weren't uh -huh. real, they were rubber because nobody let anybody have real arrowheads on their arrows mm -hmm. in the battles. Did your folks go to, the, did they go to the No, I don't pageant? know. I oh. did, my mother was up here maybe during one of those summers. And mm -hmm. she, maybe, she must have, or else she came across this stuff from George Mitchell. You see, they imported a lot of the Indians come up from uh, <clears throat> downstate. Odena, and there they set up their authentic villages, and uh, you could walk through the village. And it was typical; they were sitting oh, around their right. campfires. They lived right as an Indian village did at that time. And those days, the Indians didn't become commercial. You know, they were doing their dances because they were proud of their heritage, and uh, they were being used. But I don't think they realized they were being used at that time. And I'm not even sure if they paid most of these people any salary. It, they enjoyed getting together and living the way they used to live. And, uh, it was very they, colorful. And I can remember <coughs> the war hoops and uh, the, the Indians riding on their horses and yelling. You know, just, it was like a, the movies that you saw in later years. It was a real spectacle. That it yeah. was. It was very well, spectacular. Well, the way things started out is coming back now. They, they would, one of the scenes would be the pioneers coming around the point, uh, uh, point detour out there with their canoes, and then they would, the Indians would be on the, on the shoreline greeting them. And the acoustics, uh, they didn't have a PA system, but you, could, you knew what was going on. <clears throat> and then in the corner they'd have an Indian village, and of course these pioneers would come in and they had the flags and all these different explorers. Then another scene would be, <clears throat> The explorers setting up their log cabins and stuff, then the Indians coming in their canoes at attacking them. And uh, this whole replica of how the Indians and the whites got along trading and they came through their big birch bark mm -hmm. canoes, it was the most authentic thing that you could imagine. Huh. And it's too bad that those days they couldn't preserve that on, on film. Because, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Nothing uh, was on film. Yeah. It, it would beat anything you, that Hollywood put out because here you had the real Indians and you had these, a lot of French people around here too, you know, they had that era of the Frenchmen coming in and then the era of the English coming in. And uh, that whole hillside would be loaded with blankets, people sit in the blankets. Yes, and, everybody uh, brought a, a blanket and they sat on blankets on the hillside. And great big beautiful pine trees above us, you know, you it wasn't hot. On a warm day it was warm, but you didn't have the sun beating down on you. It was very nice. It was a natural setting for an outdoor show. No wonder Toddy mm -hmm. wants to recreate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be tremendous. Yeah. 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 Say, when you're out on the lake, besides Young Doll, what's your favorite stories about being the troller? 
You must know every single rock on every single piece of shoreline <laughs> in the whole damn lake. My favorite story you couldn't put on, on tape. Well, <laughs> try us. <laughs> <laughs> The tape records those kind of stories, too. They do. <laughs> Tell them about, you know, the early trolling days when you went out the other way. Instead well, of Long <clears throat> Island, you went out. Yeah, we used to go all the way. We call it Brownstone Island. And all we had on the boat would be our compass and a stopwatch. And uh, no radios or anything. A single, <clears throat> single engine. <clears throat> We'd leave about 6 in the morning. And we got from 15 to $25 for a 10-hour day. <laughs> and you, you navigated thick fog. You, you navigate by a stopwatch and the RPMs on your uh, engine. <clears throat> and you run so many degrees for so many minutes and you change course. And uh, the only time you knew you were lost, if you were supposed to be in Bayfield here out the <laughs> grounds and you weren't there, then you knew you were lost. But nobody knew anything about it. And uh, <clears throat> oh, there's some interesting early stories. Uh, some of the early boats didn't have the facilities, uh, modern facilities. <laughs> and so uh, one, one fellow, for instance, uh, took a uh, barrel for the potty and he built, built up a uh, plywood around the outside and that was his convenience. And it worked out pretty good till one day they got there to Northeaster. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> this particular lady got into the biffy and about that time the boat took about a 35 degree roll and she come barreling right out through the side of the uh, Plywood, <laughs> which which didn't uh, didn't make her too happy. <laughs> but but uh, <clears throat> some Was that of the Ken Dooley? No, uh, uh, those days you roughed it. You sat out in the on the boat on a uh, fish box over the engine. You pay penny ante all the way out there. You used three lines, all copper lines, and you fish bottom. And if somebody'd get bottom, they'd holler bottom. Then you'd have to back up. And one day I had three professors from the University of Wisconsin up. And we were, uh, you'd always put a life jacket on your rod and reel. In case you hit bottom, the line was gone out. So I was going along, and I looked back, and he was just about the end of the reel. And I said, what's the matter? Oh, he's got bottom or something here. I can't, I can't get loose. And I could see the, the whole thing was going, so I said, well, throw her. So he threw it overboard. I looked down here, the life jacket was sitting there. I said, what did you do? Well, he said, you told me to throw it overboard, but I said, I didn't tell you to untie the life jacket. So the whole rig went in the water. I couldn't charge him for it. I told him to threw it overboard. Oh, yes. And uh, <clears throat> I think one of the most interesting things and impressed the people a lot, Gull Island Shoals is 14 feet underwater out here off from Gull Island, north end of Madeline. And you used to leave Bayfield in a thick, thick, foggy morning. And you'd go to Gull Island Shoals, one of our favorite places for fishing. And you'd time yourself very carefully. And you'd get out there. And God Island Shoals probably is a circumference maybe 20 to 25 feet around. And you could go up there and pinpoint it. And you never put a buoy on there because you didn't want the amateurs to know where it was. And you say, now look overboard. And you look overboard and there it was. And these people were amazed that you could find it. <laughs> and uh, you did it all by compass and by stopwatch. And mostly dead reckoning. And all the fishermen could do it. I mean, it was no trick as long as you knew what your boat was. You couldn't take anybody else's boat and do it. You had to get used to your own boat. Mary, who was the guy who just shot those movies we were looking at? Lee? Oh, yeah. We Jack Lee. We found some home Jack movies Lee. of trolling. Trolling, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, did you ever take him out? Well, Jack Lee was a murky yeah. There, there's just about everybody in town that's gone with me, one time or other. <laughs> but Jack was along. Uh, Could very well have been on one of your boats. You know, there's a whole sequence Taking of movies. stuff. It might have been. Jack it was we were been. very Many. close friends. Yeah. Another good customer I had was Walter Mondale, and uh, they, he was up it was a couple of years ago. And he too would come to town and didn't want anyone to know that he was here. And uh, he was uh, still a senator at that time. He was getting run. So on the boat, he had another fellow, and they decided not. I will not run for vice president. I want no part of that. So that night we went off for dinner together, and he said, "I want to go someplace where nobody will know me." So we took him down to one of the local restaurants. And Harriet and I had more friends that night. They'd come up and say, you know, that gentleman sure looks familiar, you know. So, uh, so then the next night we had a fish bowl in, a, in the motel for him. And we invited a few friends. And during the middle of the, of the uh, fish bowl, he wanted to know if he could use the phone. So he used the phone, called back to Washington, and come out. He said, boy, there's a real crisis in Washington. Well, you know, here's a U.S. Senator. We didn't know what was happening. His daughter and had been in the gym counter riding a horse and fell off the horse and, the, and her brother was teasing her. 
So there was a family feud <laughs> in there. So then the next day he called and everything was settled. <laughs> but at that time, he said he would not run for vice president. And then I think he got talking to the uh, next month, Humphrey, and Humphrey said, this is the way to go. Real fine, being politics out, real fine gentleman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then another gentleman I had was Wallace Berry. Yeah. And the Turk from uh, yeah. George, George, George Gorgian? Yeah. Brought him up. Yeah. And uh, he wasn't at all like his movie. He was a sour, crabby old codger uh, uh, on the boat. I think he'd probably been out the night before and he had a hangover, but uh, he, uh, <laughs> he wasn't the jovial fellow you saw in the movies. The Turk yeah. had many friends. Oh, yeah. yeah he was nationwide, oh, really. And, yeah. you know, people even from Egypt that uh, came over. And he loved to go trolling with Vermont, so then he would bring his company up to go trolling. Oh, but we used to take charter trips up to Isle Royale and Duluth, and uh, I enjoyed it. You met beautiful, wonderful people trolling. Any close calls out there in the lake? I didn't have any. Harry thought I did. Uh, she, <laughs> sent, she sent the Coast Guard out with me for me several times. But uh, in those days, our boats were supplied. We had food on, and if you got caught in a storm, you pulled up behind an island, and you would lay over till the storm was over. And one night, we were out there outside of um, Devil's Island, a terrible storm come up. So we laid over, and afterwards, the storm broke, a beautiful day, so I went back fishing. Well, I got about off in Redcliffe, and I saw the Coast Guard heading out the other way. <laughs> well, those days, you didn't come out. So we got in here, and the fellows wanted to go to Madden Island, so we took off from Madden Island that time and get back a little later than usual, and uh, Mother didn't appreciate it. Oh, <laughs> you were that worried. was a terrible trick. Well, yes, because it had been, you and know, then, and all, all the other trolling boats came in, and there I was, pacing the dock <laughs> and saying, well, did you see Vermont? Well, we saw him before the storm hit, didn't see him afterwards. Of course, you get a little macho those days, you're younger, you know, and I just got out of the Coast Guard, so, you know, mm -hmm. I, can, I can ride any storm out in Lake Superior. <laughs> 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 but I, first time, it's rather interesting, too, when Judy was born, I had a trolling trip that day, and I got in at 6 o'clock with a trolling party, and I kept saying, we got to go in, my, my wife is expecting, my wife is expecting. I got in at 6 o'clock and got to Ash, and the baby was born at 7.30. Mm. Yeah. Was that, was close. Close. that was close. <laughs> and then the second one, Kathy, was born. I was coaching in Washburn, and uh, we were waiting and waiting. The baby didn't come. So finally, I said, Harriet, I've got a tournament game tonight. You're going to the hospital. I, haven't, I can't keep my mind on two things. So on the way to the game, we stopped at the hospital. I had the whole team with me. <laughs> and no, oh, nothing's happening here. Everything's fine. At halftime, over the, during the ball game, I see an intern come in, all dressed in white. And I kind of looked at him going by. This you was know. in the Dodge, Dodge Museum. Museum. Oh, I looked at him, and he went right up to the stage. <laughs> Pretty soon, they interrupted the basketball game. They said, the Washburn coach just gave birth to a baby girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, that's all. No more children. <laughs> we can't arrange it better than that. <laughs> but the team went on Did to you set win the a game? record. Did oh. you set a record that night? See, the kids do this. Sure, they won the game. About two weeks. The highest score do, you know? in the Dodge Gym. So they set a record that night. <laughs> the whole thing just exploded. In your honor. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah. See, Vermont, you were gone during the flood, but Harry, you were here or were you both here? Uh, I left a couple of days before the flood, yeah. and uh, I was sitting in New York in camp, and a fellow next to me was reading the uh, Superior Telegram. I looked up, I said, where are you from? He said, Superior. I said, I'm from Bayfield. He said, oh, you've got a bad flood there. I said, don't, you can't be, not in Bayfield. Oh, he said, look at here, here are headlines. So he showed me the paper. So I ran right down to the uh, Red Cross and I tried to call Bayfield and of course all the phones yeah. and everything was out. So I asked for emergency leave and they said, no, you can't do anything there anyway. So I was gone, but Harriet was here and she, mm -hmm. she had some. Uh, yes, I w it was between my junior and senior year at the University of Wisconsin. I was home for the summer and I was waitressing at Meyer's restaurant, mm -hmm. which was located where Stern and Fields is uh, now and uh, it rained all that afternoon on July 17th poured down rain and by 11 o'clock in the evening there was no one left on the street it had rained all day and so Anna Meyer said we might as well lock up and go home there's not going to be anybody else in here they had a, an ice cream parlor in conjunction with the restaurant so they did get a lot of evening business when the weather was nice because people came in for malteds and ice cream sundaes and uh, so at 11 o'clock I walked home walked up uh, 
you know, to where my folks lived, the picket house, and had no more than gotten in bed. At 12.30, the fire whistle began to blow. And we just thought it was a fire. Well, when the fire whistle <coughs> didn't stop blowing, we decided it was more than just a fire. So my dad got up and said, well, he'd go downtown to see where the fire was and if they needed more help. And uh, mother and I stayed up and the fire whistle blew continuously all night long. Well, we realized, and it, at the same time, the rain never let up, so we knew that the rain had something to do with it, but we did not realize that Bayfield was actually flooding out. About 4.30, quarter to five, as daylight began to come up, Mother and I said, well, let's, in the meantime, we had sat on the basement steps all night because it, the storm was terrible. It never stopped thundering and the cracks of lightning were so vivid, it, it was just like Was daylight. it blowing hard during that time? No, I don't remember the wind, but the, uh, it was such a terrible electric storm. And usually an electric storm will last maybe a yeah. half hour or hour and yeah. it's blown itself out. This didn't, it continued for hours. And uh, of course, Dad never got back home. He was, once he got downtown, we, unknown to us, he began helping the sandbagging efforts. Well, anyway, at quarter to five, Mother and I decided we'd w walk downtown. And as we left the house on McCarty's Corner, there's a transformer there, and this was just sparking. It, uh, the lines were down, and so we knew that we had to proceed with caution. Very carefully, we walked downtown, and as we got to uh, Rittenhouse Inn Corner, it seemed to me that all four corners of that intersection were a mass of fire on the ground. Electric lines that were laying on the ground and sparking, arcing. Uh, we can, by that time then we could see all the activity on Main Street and it was just bedlam and confusion and people working and big rocks in the middle of the street, and of course, uh, Johnson's Food Shop and um, the drugstore were gone, the bakery was gone. These were just smoldering embers by five o'clock in the morning because so much of the building had, once it caught fire, it just, the flood took it. Uh, so Mother and I proceeded on down to Main Street and we began uh, organizing people and trying to get coffee to the to the sandbaggers and the people who were working up in the ravine. Uh, we actually built a little fire right right at the intersection by the old bank, okay. which is now the Mad Islander, between the Mad Islander and Marie Nelson store. Uh, no, it's not Marie now. But, yeah, but you no, know, track that, and trail. Yeah. Right. Uh, we built a little fire right in the middle of the street and had big coffee pots and paper cups, and we carried coffee. And gradually, people who had baked goods at home brought them so that if we had uh, cookies or something to give with the coffee, we did. But most of the coffee that we carried went right up to that. Uh, uh, well, where uh, the Eulery is now. See, that was where the, the main part of the destruction was. Then, as, as all of the damage, the news of the damage came in, Bayfield really got organized, and there were crews who went up and worked at the cemetery, and my dad worked up there. He, uh, and that was a, a hard job because oh. they were collecting bodies and trying to identify people. They had two um, morticians who came in, one from Superior and one from Ashland, and helped the local mor mortician, and uh, they reburied many of them. Just a year ago this fall, Marie Malden and I went up to the cemetery and found where the mass graves are, because I had remembered that after they buried, uh, 
the remains of people who were not identified. One evening, Dad took Mother and I up because he wanted to show us where that grave was. So I had seen it, but then in the intervening 40 mm -hmm. years, I had never gone back. And curiosity piqued mm -hmm. me, and I said, let's go up and find that grave. And we found them. Uh, I have uh, mixed feelings. At first, I thought I should you know, write, write about this and give my written document to the Historical Society just so it would be on record. And then a couple of people said to me, well, you know, let the past bury itself and don't keep it alive. So I have mixed feelings on it. But I, I think maybe this fall I'm going to go back up there again and see if in some simple but nice way these graves can be marked. Mm -hmm. That's part of Bayfield's history. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should just let nature reclaim them. I'm sorry. Oh, I keep forgetting. When Jim says okay, Holly's got to say okay too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. After the cemetery and, and your dad working up there, what other crews were working? Well, of course, this, the, there were many. The, the entire um, uh, lumber yard, the lower part of uh, all of waterfront of Bayfield, was completely under sand. Then, as the water receded, there were, was about three uh, extra feet of uh, sand down in the mill slip area. So, the the flimsy buildings had been washed into the lake. Uh, my dad's warehouse, where the DX station now has a warehouse, uh, that had been, and hundreds of cases of oil had been washed into the lake. Uh, the cannery had, the waters had just swept through the bean cannery and the floor and everything was filled with two or three feet of sand. I don't know how many cars were buried, had been swept down into that area and then were buried in the sand. So it took a lot of digging for Bayfield to dig out of this. Um, Main Street was, of course, that was the big area that, that needed uh, work done. And then up on the Norwegian Lutheran Church corner, that was completely washed out. And the ravine one block east of that. So there were two, two mm -hmm. streets up in that area that were completely washed out. For a few days following the flood, the National Guard came in so that uh, just to prevent looting. But you know, it was really unnecessary because as I think about it, we heard nothing of anyone stealing or taking anything. In fact, the townspeople all turned out and, and helped people uh, clean up their businesses and get back in business again. Uh, well, everybody knew nobody everyone lost anyway, anything. right? I mean. Uh, that's right. It <laughs> you was, know. you know, a small community is very tight knit. And uh, in good times and bad times, they will help each other. And so there really, there was no looting, no robbery. Uh, we didn't have water, and I can remember that they were very careful that you boiled your water and uh, for until Bayfield once again they had gotten the pipes fixed and you could draw water from a tap. But I remember my folks <coughs> telling me it was right during sugar rationing and about a week before <clears throat> I went into service, we went to Duluth and brought a whole truckload of sugar and had it in the basement of the store. And of course, we lived in the back of the store. And it, um, the night that the flood started, I can remember them telling about people coming in to help to carry this sugar out of the basement. And that those days, 100 pounds of sugar is only about $4, you know. And they carried the flour, which is 99 cents a bag, that heavy stuff upstairs to try to, so the water wouldn't get it left all of our household furnishes in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, the day before my folks' 25th wedding anniversary, so they had all the gifts and everything in there. But, Sitting out in their apartment. But instead of saving any of that, they were concerned of getting this sugar because they knew it was rationed, so they carried all the sugar up. And before I went into service, I had purchased a lot of 
tra fishing equipment, outboard motors, because I knew after the war it'd be hard to get. So there's brand new outboard motors laying there, brand new jumping skis, all this stuff had never been used because we were, I was saving it until after the war. So they lost all that, but they brought up that crazy sugar. <laughs> and, and then it washed out anyway because the whole building went. Everything went. And uh, just last summer, one of the people in Bayfield brought me a little trinket that was the last item that was sold that night out of the store. Oh, they were having a birthday party with Edith Powers having a birthday party for one of her friends and she forgot the gift so she went down, called my dad up and said, can I get in and get something? So he opened the store and sold her some of these little lantern trinkets. Full of candy. And she gave me one of those. Oh, and, God, I love it. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, That's they, a riot. Yeah, they lost everything. In fact, they had to take a boat, I understand, over to Ashland to get uh, clothing to wear. Yeah, they so, didn't. They had night clothes on. And the, the only mm -hmm. the fatality that day was uh, Eddie Bruner's Dog. Dog that lived upstairs. <laughs> it's the only thing that, and that washed down. When the, the building collapsed, uh, it went so fast that the fire department just screamed, everybody get out of the building, you know, and uh, the dog was left behind, and that was the only casualty. So they were, they were lucky. Wow. What was your mother's maiden name? My mother was Blanche Darrell, and she come from Prairie Farm. And again, they were a very large family, so she, they sent her to Bayfield. I think she was about six, seven years old, and lived with a family by the name of Welch, and that was their, her uh, aunt, aunt and uncle. Aunt and mm -hmm. uncle, and they raised her, and um, she lived all of her life in Bayfield, and they married my dad, mm -hmm. who's also in Bayfield. I remember your mother. I don't remember your dad at all. Yeah, she, uh, she was a Darrell, and. Uh, mm -hmm was raised. So both my parents were raised hmm. by foster yeah. foster parents. Hmm. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. When did the um, uh, Myers go from being a restaurant to a drugstore? Oh, well, um, I'm trying to think about when that was. They went out of the restaurant business, I would assume, in the 1950s. Hmm. And uh, so when Morgan th got through school, it turned into a drugstore. That's drug right. Yeah. He had oh, uh, taken pharmacy, and and he started a drugstore there. Because I absolutely have no recollection of anything except soda fountain in there. What's the other side? Oh. They had a tavern on the other side. See, there was the tavern on one side and the ice cream parlor. Yeah, but by the time I'm going there. in and out of there, there was the whole building was the drugstore. Oh, oh I see. For your yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the summer of 1942, the summer of 1941, I had also worked for the Myers in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And Nettie Wilson was their yeah. cook. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fred ran the tavern on one side, and Anna ran the restaurant on the oh, other side. Fine. And they were wonderful. Oh, folks. yeah. That's Very a great good. building. Mm -hmm. yeah, nice. uh -huh. And then did they live upstairs then, or was that just apartments? No, they lived down. Uh, uh, where Rich Erickson lives oh. now. Oh, for mm -hmm. okay. That's where they lived. And they had three children. Anna and Fred had three children. And, and uh, they'd come up and come in the back door at the restaurant and eat. And yep, just like uh -huh. my kids do now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> they knew where to find the food. Yeah. You know, one person that, and this just triggered it, one person that we keep forgetting to track down. Slay, and came in from our farm, which is uh, four miles west of Bayfield, came into the store on a Saturday, loaded the sleigh with all the groceries and everything they wanted to send out to Sand Island, and then he and this uh, helper went out to Sand Bay, crossed over on the ice over to Sand Island. By the time they got unloaded, and I I'm, I'm sure they ate whoever, wherever they unloaded all their groceries. Somebody must have fed them. Yeah, and it's hills, then, I'm sure, because that's sure, where the store was. Yes, uh, they started back. In the meantime, the, uh, the storm had really picked up in velocity, and Dad said it was just howling when they left the island. And by the time they got out in the middle, they could not see land in back of them or in front of them. And of course, the tracks from the 
the trip over were completely obliterated by the snow. And the horses would stop because the wind was blowing so hard and the, the snow was blowing and it would sting their eyes and the horses would just stop in their tracks and he'd have to get off the sleigh and lead them and make them go on. And he said he, he was certain they were lost and both of them knew they were lost. <clears throat> And it was just a matter of, you know, just keep trying and hope that you'll hit mainland ahead of you. And ultimately they did. But it was very, very late that night before he got back to Bayfield and let off his passenger and then back home to the farm. And both mother and dad talked about that many times in later years. So I'm sure it had been a very frightening experience mm. for both of them. And with such a terrible storm, a snowstorm, I'm sure Mother was very worried too, wondering, you know, I wonder what's happened to him. And uh, one heck so, of a trip. yes, uh huh. So that's those amazing. are that's, but that's the way people lived, you know, back in those days. And you really did things, and you didn't worry that much about it because everybody else uh, was putting up with the same kind of weather. And you just accepted it as your surroundings. Great stories. Mm -hmm. Sure you don't want to finish off with just one good boat story? <laughs> 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 we'll edit it in case we have to. <laughs> okay. And guess about it. What do you think of Bayfield's future? It's tremendous. What do you think is going to happen here? In the next years, it's changing, right? It's changing. Mm -hmm. I hope it changes with control, which I think it is. I hope it doesn't become a tourist trap, because it's, I think Bayfield is Bayfield because of being unique and being a little bit different. It, be, it gets like all the other tourist resorts are just going to move on to some other place, and. Uh, I think Bayfield is the heritage of Bayfield has been preserved pretty quite well and I think the only thing we have to be concerned with is some of these quick artists coming in and we had them in our day at the pageant ground but there was enough Bayfield we've had them more recently than that but, <laughs> but there's been enough right. Bayfield to survive there's more to Bayfield than just the business district and Bayfield is, is Bayfield per se it's a different unique and uh, I guess the things that concern when I started talking about yesterday is junior I got a, he'll never talk to us, but I got a, Junior Yeska, I got to oh. go find people to talk about him. Yeah, I mean, he'd run, you think you want to get out of here now, or Bud Yench didn't want to talk. I mean, he won't even answer the telephone. Oh, golly, he, he has, has some yeah, interesting he has, he has stories. Some so he yeah. moved in from Cornucopia. Yeah. But I'll let him, you can dance on about that. Yeah, yeah no, I'll figure it out. Now, you got one more story you said was off the record, but I don't know why in the world that one was off the record. Talk about your dad taking groceries to Santa Island. Oh, well. That's a wonderful yeah, story. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a big, tall, very strong man, and uh, very tall, and he had a thick Norwegian accent that he never lost. And when we lived on the Turnquist farm, uh, it wasn't until about 1927 or 28 that the folks had a, bought a car. Before that, we traveled by horse. And my dad had, the Turn, Turnquist family had really been impressed by him. I think they could see that he was just a big husky Norwegian who had come over here and through sheer hard work was going to survive. And uh, so they, they really liked him. And they had him do extra things for him, for them. And they had asked him if he would take a load of groceries out to Sand Island. And this was in the middle of winter. And they sent some man with him, some young fellow with him. Uh, and it was in 1926 that he did this. So he would have been about 41 years old. 26 and 15, 41? Yeah. Uh, so he hitched up the team of horses in a big, heavy. Reminds me is that some of these old-time people, uh, like her dad, 
that had enough intestinal fortitude to hold cohesive, to hold it together. And if we get too many newcomers come in here, you're going to lose that cohesiveness. They're going to, they're going to lose the true meaning of Bayfield. And Although I really think there are, that on the whole, the majority of people in Bayfield want to, it to retain its charm and uh, its personality that it has developed through the years. And I think that, that people are going to be guardians of Bayfield. And pretty much they're going to speak up when things happen that they, they think they don't want to see happen. Do you, do you play that role now? Do you feel you do? Mm -hmm. you, yeah, you I think I do. Uh -huh. They both do. Yeah, I think we do. Well, that's great. You know, uh, I'm just speaking now for the Civic League because that happens to be an organization I'm interested in. And I can't ever remember my mother, and she was president of it for many years, ever saying, you know, I think we have to protect the park. I think we have to do this or that with the park. It just seemed to me the park took care of itself through the Bayfield Civic League. But now, this generation of people who are members of the Bayfield Civic League are very much aware that this is their responsibility to keep the park and to follow what is in the deed, the land that was given to the Civic League for a park. And they are really following it. They're seeing that it's beautified, that it, that, um, it isn't going to be destroyed, or that it, mm -hmm. it, nobody's going to use it for anything but a park. So I think, you know, on the whole, that's just an example, but I think that people are very much aware of what Bayfield can be, and they don't want it to be become a commercial item. Yep. Was mm -hmm. your mother president during the time when they told the cows to stay behind or was that before? <laughs> no, that was after. But <laughs> I, mother often told those stories about, oh, uh -huh, uh -huh, about every, well, do you know as I grew up in Bayfield, I, every other person had still had a cow. Do you yeah. know, this was back in the 1930s and people still had cows. When we lived up in the Lehigh, Lehigh house, uh, I would go to Jensen's, which was in the next block, uh, every day at 5 o'clock with a tin pail and get a pail of milk from the Jensen's. Now, they lived right That's in town, and, and they had, had yes, they had mm -hmm. uh, milk. They had cows right there in their yard, right in back of the house. Um, I also went, uh, where else? Up by um, where David Borth lived. Somebody up in that area had a cow, and for a while we bought milk from them. Many people had cows, and this was as So it was after your mother was president that they put out the, 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 the notice came, please keep your cows? <laughs> no, that was before. before your mother, mother yeah. was president in the 1950s. Oh, okay. And right. uh, through the 1950s oh, yeah. and 1960s. And so by that time, uh, oh, yeah, they the didn't have to worry. Was the, that was taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite yeah. stories mm -hmm. of the whole thing. Oh, God. Well, thank you both for... Well.